Krishna. Om Magyana Timarandasya Kyananjana Shalakaya Chaksuran Militanyena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Pristaya Bhutale Srimati Bhakti Vedanta Swami Niti Namine Namaste Sarasati Devi Gauravani Pracharine Nirvishesha Shunyavadi Paschatya Deshatarine Vanchakaupata Rubyascha Kripa Sindhu Bhayevacha Patitanam Pavani Bhyo Vaishnavibhyo Namo Namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhar Shri Vasadikor Bhaktavinda Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Rama Hare Hare. So welcome all the devotees to our Bhakti Shastri. Uh, let me see. We're studying Bhagavad Gita. Is everyone able to see the screen? Yes, Maharaj. Yes, Maharaj. Yes, Maharaj. All right. So we're on lesson number seven. Niskama Karma Yoga. And we're going into the third chapter. So we are going to begin here with the a look at the overview of the third chapter. I think you already have the overview in your student handbook. But anyway, it begins with a question by Arjuna. Arjuna wants to understand what do you want us to do? Do you want us to take the path of knowledge or the path of karma? Arjuna is confused. Do you want us to work or do you want us just to cultivate knowledge, buddhi? Arjuna is thinking, he's thinking if you work you don't have knowledge, if you have knowledge you don't work. <laughs> right? There's a lot of people like that today. They have knowledge, they don't work. Tad ekam vada. Say one thing, Arjuna is saying. So then Krishna replies and he explains Karma Yoga is superior to Karma Sanyas. We covered that a bit last week. You'll remember we were speaking about uh, better to be active rather than trying to stop everything, trying to subdue the, all the activities. It's better to be engaged in a positive manner in the service of Krishna. So in that sense, karma yoga is superior to karma sannyas. And then texts 10 to 16 describe how by karma kanda we can come to karma yoga. So karma kanda is material, it's a fruit of activity. But by doing karma kanda activities, it will lead to karma yoga. And then 17 to 21 describe uh, the, the principle of not having any duty to perform, like Lord Krishna doesn't have any duty, but still he would act for the purpose of showing an example. So that's what we call the Acharya principle. We have to show the right example to everyone. We don't want to be lazy and do nothing. We want to show a nice example. And Lord Krishna sets the example. Lord Krishna himself sets the example. But then Lord Krishna says, don't, don't disturb the attached. There are people who are very attached. And so better than trying to instruct them is show them the example. We would say example speaks louder than words. If we tell people to do something but we don't do it ourselves, it's not a very good instruction. But if we show the right example, 
then it can inspire people to act properly. And then the chapter finishes with the section on lust, an important section. Lust is described as Nitya Vairina, the eternal enemy. So this is the <coughs> these are the main points in the third chapter. Let's go ahead, go back to look at Arjuna's question. Right? Maybe you like to read it together. We can all read it together, rather than just I ask one person to read or you listen to me read. Let's all read it together. Arjuna uvacha jayasi chet karmanaste matabhuti chanarana stattim karmani kovema Arjuna said, yeah, read together, read the English also. Arjuna said, Arjuna said, O Janadana, why do you want to engage me in this casting body? If you think that the intelligence is better than that work, they won't do the work. All right, so we have. Arjuna's question, which, which, what do you want us to do, karma or buddhi? Mm -hmm. The two. <laughs> Vishnu. Uh, Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes, Prabhu. Maharaj, why here uh, addressing like as uh, Janardana and Keshava, both together? <laughs> yeah. Well. <laughs> I don't know, I'd have to check and see what the Acharyas say about that. Does Prabhupada comment in the purport? Is there any mention in the purport about it? There must be some reason. Janardan means Keshava means that he's superior to Shiva and Brahma. Arjuna is aware of Krishna's position. He's, uh, he, he's aware of Krishna's divinity. We see this coming out in different places. We already heard Arjuna address Lord Krishna as Madhusudana, the killer of the demon Madhu. So Madhu, that was a long time ago, right? That was many uh, millions of years before Krishna appeared. So Arjuna is well aware of Lord Krishna's divinity. And therefore, when he addresses them with these names, Janardan, what is the meaning Janardan? Does it mean the Lord in the heart? I can't remember exactly, you know. I'd have to, I have to look in my uh, scriptures. Let me see if I can open my... Oh, I see. And you're, you're forgetting, you're asking me. Maharaj, <laughs> uh, uh, Janasan means uh, the ultimate desire of an individual. The final desire of an individual is uh, Krishna. So that is how Krishna is termed as Janasan. Okay. And Keshava means uh, like Supreme Lord Krishna, who is Supreme Controller and who is Master of K and Shiva. I mean, Brahma and Shiva. Right. I knew that part, that he is master of Brahma Arash, and Shiva. Janardana meaning is one who bestows boons on one and all, all jana, who bestows his boons on all of them. That's what uh, is written. Oh, really? Okay. Yes. Yeah, it's not in Burijan's purport to this verse. It may be in some other place, but it's not in the relation to this verse. I just checked in the surrender unto me, and there's no yes, mention. Yes, Maharaj, not in this verse, but another place, in, in some... another uh, shaloka. Okay, Prabhu, thank you very much. And you said uh, one who bestows blessings on everyone, is it? 
Jnanadan yes, means what? One and all. That's what Prabhupada's purport somewhere else says. Gives, one and all. Gives blessings to one and all. Okay. All right. So how we relate like uh, this this explanation here in this in this shaloka? Both Janardana and Keshava for engaging me in ghastly welfare warfare. Well, he, Arjuna, Arjuna understands under, Arjuna understands that Krishna has the answers to all of his questions because he's the Supreme Lord, so he knows everything. And so he can answer. And so he's, he's addressing him as Janardan Keshava, indi indicating that he's aware of the divine position, the absolute position of Lord Krishna, and he wants to understand why do you want to engage me in this ghastly warfare? That with, you know, to fight a war, it's not a very pleasant thing. Why would the Lord want that his devotee should take part in a war? Particularly when Arjuna is considering that he has heard from Krishna in the second chapter, in his understanding was that Krishna was telling him that intelligence is better than fruit of work. Because uh, I'll, we'll see, see in a minute that that will be brought up. And so, if you have questions, remember Arjuna accepted Lord Krishna as his spiritual master. So you have questions, you have doubts, you come before your spiritual teacher and you express your doubts. So Arjuna is taking the position of the disciple and Lord Krishna is going to be the teacher and explain to him and answer to him. So it's, it's proper that he is honouring Lord Krishna by calling him names like Janardhan and Keshava. And remember they're intimate friends, but at the same time Arjuna has become the disciple and he's confident that Krishna can give him the real knowledge to understand properly everything. Okay, here's Vishwanath Chakravarti's commentary on it. Vishwanath Chakravarti's commentary sometimes goes a little bit into it. You know, it may help us to understand a little bit. I'll just read it through. If fixed intelligence, buddhi or bhakti, transcending the gunas is superior, jayasi, then why do you engage me in this terrible action in the form of war? So these are Arjuna's words. O oh Janardhan, by your order you are causing pain, Ardhana, to your own associates, Jana. It is also not possible to avoid following your order, O oh Keshava controller of even Brahma and Shiva. Ka means Brahma, Isha means Shiva, and Va means Vyasi, you control. So this way, Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur has paraphrased Arjuna's words, or Arjuna's uh, doubt to Lord Krishna. Arjuna's confusion. Arjuna said, O Janardhan, O Keshava, why do you want to engage me in this ghastly warfare if you think that intelligence is better than fruit of work? And then in the second verse, my intelligence is bewildered by your equivocal instructions. Therefore, please tell me decisively which will be most beneficial for me. And so Arjuna is confused. The instructions seem to contradict each other. So tell me clearly, what is the most beneficial thing for me to do? And analyzing Arjuna's confusion, if you remember in the second chapter, uh, Lord Krishna had quoted in verse number 11, Ashochan and Vashochas Twam. Do you remember text number 11? While speaking learned words, Arjun, 
You are mourning for what is not worthy of grief. Those who are wise lament neither for the living nor the dead. Krishna was, he began his instructions on knowledge. And Prabhupada in the purport notes, by knowing the difference between the body and soul, one achieves liberation. So this was knowledge. This was the platform of knowledge, which was introduced in the very early, in the very beginning of Lord Krishna's instructions. But then, later on, if we go to text, well, text number 39 first, in relation to karma, it says, Esha te bihita sankhye. Karma yoga is a process to achieve liberation. And then in text 31, it says, Dhammyadi di yudhashrenyat shatriyashya navidyate. Text number 31, it establishes the superiority of karma. So, it appears, you know, contradictory, equivocal. Uh, which, which is superior? Knowledge is superior or karma is superior? And then at the end of the chapter, remember at the end of the chapter, last week, we had the verse, Esha Brahmi Stiti Parta Nainam Prapya Vimuyati, which established the superiority of buddhi to karma. That buddhi yoga or intelligence was superior to even karma. So this way we can we want to understand Arjuna's confusion. Buddhi is superior to karma, karma is superior, but no, you can also get liberation by knowledge. <laughs> so, uh, just analyzing a little bit here, the text number three of the third chapter, hmm. We can see some differences. On one hand, you have the the Sankhyaites. The Sankhyaites they explain that consciousness comes about by combination of material elements. Then they have that that mood that the goal is to just control the senses, and ultimately, ultimately everything is just one. So 261 says, Tani Sarvani Samyamya Yukta Asita Matpara, Matpara in relationship with me, one who restrains his senses, keeping them under full control. So this, this, this is like a meditation on the impersonal Brahman. You restrain the senses, keeping them under control, and you should be situated in relationship with me. But we don't actually have any, the Sankhyaites, you know, their idea, ultimately everything is Brahman. They're impersonalists at the best. So they meditate on the Brahman. So, but that is a pure consciousness. And then you have the karma yogis. Karma yogis, their consciousness is not so pure because, as quoted in text 31, there's no better engagement for you. Remember Arjuna is a kshatriya. The be what's the best engagement for him? Fighting on religious principles. So the understanding is that if you don't have pure consciousness, it can become pure by doing karma yoga. That Arjuna, if he's just fighting, maybe he's fighting, thinking, can go to the heavenly planets, opens the doors to, you know, swarga dwara mapavritam, right? Opens the doors to heaven. And so if the Kshatriya is fighting like that, but Better than that is fighting according to religious principles. According to religious principles, this is karma yoga. 
you do it with detachment. So this can be, this is pure. So it's not pure in the beginning, but it can become pure. So two, two sides to it. And here we see verse quoted from the fifth chapter explaining there's no difference between karma and jnana. One who knows that the position reached by means of analytical study, analytical study meaning jnana or sankhya, can also be attained by devotional service. Devotional service meaning buddhi yoga. And who therefore sees analyt analytical study, sankhya, and devotional service, buddhi yoga, to be on the same level, sees things as they are. So in this way, Lord Krishna equates buddhi yoga with sankhya. So, we want to hear from you. You know, Prabhupada often said, uh, religion without philosophy, what did he call it? Religion without... Huh? Religion without philosophy is sentiment. Yes, re religion without philosophy is sentiment, and philosophy without religion is... Mental speculation. Right. So here, we said, religion without philosophy can be fanaticism. It can be, if there's no f proper philosophy. What are some examples in daily life of fanatic religionists? And we often hear people say, you're fanatics. And you know, as a Hare Krishna devotee, many times people would tell me, I must be fanatic. Because we do things like shave our heads, and we wear these not Western clothes. We wear these things like dhotis and kurtas, and we go singing and dancing in the streets. So they say we are fanatics. What are some other examples of fanatics? So, some Maharaj, are... there is there is one particular organization where there is this uh, gentleman. He wears some kind of turban, he has deep beard, and he just laughs, and when somebody asks him question, he just beats around the bush. But people are attracted to the way he presents himself, good English, and all those kind of things. It's his presentation, but there is actually no philosophy. So people are just following him because he speaks very nice, he has got good fan following and all. So it's not even a true religion, honestly. Oh yeah, I know who you mean. And sometimes he gets up and dances, right? <laughs> yeah, I know who you mean. I won't say his name. He is so bogus. He sometimes even speaks of Radha Krishna. And it just makes no sense what he talks at all. There's no sense at all. <laughs> but still he has so many followers. The blind follow the blind. Yeah, he was so mad rush when he came to Melbourne Maharaj that his tickets were pre-booked and just yeah he was so what he was sold out when he came to melbourne oh he got a sold out house huh? oh wow. yeah so many people come like to come and hear him <laughs> mm, interesting yeah okay very good manaji thank you anybody else give me an example of fanatics I, I was reading, if you're keeping up with the news, right, you know, these a lot of headlines about Taliban. <laughs> and uh, they're claimed, people claim they're very fanatical. We hear different things which they do, you know, like, uh, you know, women, you know, their, their, their attitude towards women, women shouldn't work, which is actually not a bad thing. Many of their <laughs> principles we would agree with. You know, things like women not going to work is actually not such a bad thing. It actually protects women. Although women may like to go to work, it's actually better for them to be at home and to take care of their families than to go off to work. 
but some things are fanatical, certainly, you know, that uh, uh, a woman, if a woman commits adultery, she can be stoned to death. <laughs> some of these things are quite uh, extreme. So, fanatic. There, are, there is a lot of fanaticism, uh, or we could say sentimentalism, that comes up later. How do we deal with such people, fanatics? How do you deal with them? You just stay away from them, do you? Nobody's speaking. Yes, my we should alert them as that's what uh, annoys us. Uh, you just stay away from them. You don't argue with them. No but point. Individual. It depends on me. Sorry? Depends on the individual? Maharaj, I was trying to say that depends upon the uh, individual. Like, you know, the level of uh, fanatism or the level of uh, mundane speculation the one is having. For example, you know, normally in India we have seen that during the Navratri festival, individuals who don't walk, I mean, who walk barefoot, so they don't wear slippers for those nine days. And they don't eat meat and all these things for those nine days only. And then they again, on the, from the tenth day, they again start doing all these nonsense things. Uh -huh. So, at least to those individuals, you know, <clears throat> they, their philosophy is without religion. Whatever they are doing is just mental perspective. So, to them, at least we can try to give them a real knowledge, what real knowledge is and what is the science behind everything as Prabhupada said, you know, this is science. So we can give them this gyan and if they are ready to accept, then we can try bringing them. Well, it's a bit like, you know, in Govardhan Leela, uh, when Nanda Maharaj was doing Indra Yagya, Lord Krishna asked Nanda Maharaj, he said, is this, uh, is this Shastrik? Or is it just some tradition which we have among our people? So often things like Nav Navratri and like that, it's more the tradition that people do it, you know. They, of course it's not based on philosophy or Shastra or anything, but they have a tradition, they do it. Mm. Okay, do we, what about the next part? Do we ourselves sometimes fall into a sentimental outlook on Krishna consciousness? Do we, are we, are we sentimental? What, and what are the symptoms of such sentimentality? Now we do see in the, in the scripture, in the Chaitanya Charitamrita, when Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was in Banaras, he was chanting and dancing, and the Mayavadi sannyasis declared him to be a sentimentalist, because he was simply singing and dancing, and not studying Vedanta. And he said he's a sentimentalist, and he doesn't know Vedanta. That was the accu accusation put against Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So do we sometimes fall into that kind of sentimental out outlook? Certainly we can do as devotees, we can be sentimental. What are some symptoms of such sentimentality? Parat, sometimes like in Kirtan or something, uh, there is uh, like tears come out very rarely, but sometimes that, that happens that... Yes. Yes, right. In the Kirtan, maybe in the Kirtan, maybe very powerful Kirtan. Or you may be... I, I remember sometime when Srila Prabhupada was present and we were making offerings to Srila Prabhupada, devotees were speaking, so particularly girls, when they would speak sometimes they would, they would break down and, and cry, you know, maybe you could say this was sentiment. So certainly uh, people consider, you know, sometimes our presentation of Krishna consciousness, singing and dancing, they think we must be also sentimentalists. They don't always appreciate that we have a very rich philosophy. 
And just as they did not appreciate Lord Chaitanya initially, but when they met Lord Chaitanya, then Lord Chaitanya could impress upon the Mayavadi sannyasis how we did have a very powerful philosophy. And he did, impre he did impress on Prakashananda Saraswati and his followers the importance of chanting Hare Krishna and that that was the real conclusion of Vedanta. So what are the symptoms of such sentimentality? Anyone like to suggest something else? Uh, one thing, Maharaj, uh, that I can think of is uh, like generally uh, we think Golokera Premdan, Harinam Sankirtan. So we just do Harinam Sankirtan. We don't try to read Prabhupada books, attend classes. We just attend uh, Aarti's, Kirtans. We relish Kirtan and then once Bhagavatam class starts, leave the temple. So. Yeah, we don't have. Yeah, right. They simply like singing and dancing and they don't have much philosophical understanding. Right. Not, not a great depth of philosophy. Thank you, Prabhu. Okay, we'll go ahead. So, speaking about the sannyasa or karma sannyas, because it was mentioned. So, the renounced order of life can be accepted when one has been purified by the discharge of the prescribed form of duties which are laid down just to purify the hearts of materialistic men. Without purification one cannot attain success by abruptly adopting the fourth order of life, sannyas. Without purification of heart, sannyas is simply a disturbance to the social order. So we have seen in our own Krishna Consciousness movement, the uh, Prabhupada would give sannyas to young men and it would be very difficult for them to maintain the sannyas. And Prabhupada would be disappointed that they did not take their order of sannyas very seriously and after taking the sannyas, some t for some time, then they give it up and they leave it. So that is certainly a disturbance to the social order. Now it's different in things like Buddhism. If one becomes a Buddhist monk, you don't have to remain a Buddhist monk for life. And just like, you know, you join the military, you become a soldier, they don't become a... Th it's not that they have to be soldiers all their life. They make a contract, maybe for so many years, and after some time, you know, they'll retire and give up. So similarly, uh, some monks, they don't do it for long. But actually in the Vedic culture, the sannyas, order of life, was meant to be the final stage of life. And one was not meant to give it up. And, of course, in order to do that, one has to be very firmly situated in the mood of detachment from material life. So one has to purify the heart. That's the point. If we have not had, if, if, if we prematurely enter into the sannyas life, then you get problems. So one has to prepare himself for entering in order to enter into the renounced order of life. And the preparation is to accept, as is to purify the heart. So nowadays in ISKCON they have rules like no young men can be initiated as sannyas. They should be at least 40 years of age before even thinking about sannyas. That's uh, requirement now. So it gives them more time to purify their heart and to think and to be sure about which way they want to go and what they want to do. Okay, this is from Prabhupada's Purport, chapter 3, verse 4. 
discussing the meaning of karma sannyas, text number five. Everyone is forced to act helplessly according to the qualities he has acquired from the modes of material nature. Therefore, no one can refrain from doing something, not even for a moment. So very difficult to stop activities, to give up activities. So here on the right it said, karma sannyas means having no attachment to karma. In fact, one cannot give up work. Verse number five states we cannot give up work, but we explain karma sannyas means we should not be attached to the results of our work having no attachment to the karma. So we ask the question, how can one perform work without attachment? Would anyone like to... We, we, we have to work. How can we work without being attached? By the fruit okay. marriage that... Uh, the fruits uh, we we can renounce without uh, the fruits have to be used in service of the Lord. Yes, we can give the fruits, offering the fruits for sup for the Lord. That's certainly true. We want to get karma yoga is like that that you give the fruit of the work away. So that would be one way in which we can perform work without attachment. We may have some attachment. We may have uh, an attachment to the result, but if we're willing to give it away, uh, we're willing to give it out for others, then that, that's good. Yes? Anybody else? Anything? Certainly. Once we do work as a matter of duty or out of love, and not for the fruit of the activity, that is another way uh, we, we, do, we can perform work without attachment to results or without attachment. You do, but, but for the person, yes, attachment to the person, yes. And you said out of duty or out of love? Uh, both are different levels, Maharaj. One can perform work out of duty or better is one can perform out of love. Love of the work? No, no, Maharaj. The, 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 the Krishna, love of Krishna or the subject whom we are trying to serve. Oh, you want to do everything for Krishna. Of course, that's the highest level, all right. Yeah? And one has to perform work. And so, generally, find people, they, they like their work, they enjoy their work, and they work. So, when they offer the results of their work, then that helps them to get detachment. But difficult for people just simply to stop work, not to work. Everybody's going to be active. They like to do things. They want to work. And it's hard for people in old age, when they get old, they don't know what to do. They don't know how to, how to occupy themselves, what to do with their time. And we see people, we see older people, what they do, the, they will sit and they read, read, read newspapers and watch television, play cards, these different things, gambling. They have no real aim in life. So the Vedic system, the Vedic culture is very important for people. And Prabhupada writes, in the times of uh, Lord Krishna, there was one Dhritarashtra, but today there's a Dhritarashtra in everyone's home. And you, and in everyone's home, some old man is sitting there waiting to die. And they don't want to get out of the house for just now. Of the two, work in devotional service is better 
than renunciation of work. So work and devotion is better than renunciation of work. As Prabhu said, love is higher than just simply renouncing the work or the fruit of the work if we work in love. However, not everyone is genuine, is not worthy of the philosophy. If he is not following the principles of the philosophy, then his knowledge has no effect. Oh, Lord Krishna has stated here, text number seven, on the other hand, if a sincere person tries to control the active senses by the mind and begins karma yoga in Krishna consciousness without attachment, he is by far superior. Right? He, he's, he's working. He's superior. Although we may think that the jnani is in the position. Now jnana yoga is above karma yoga. So we think the one who is in the position of jnana yoga, he's better than the karma yogi. Karma yogi, he doesn't have much knowledge. He just works. But we think the jnana yogi, he's, he's the advanced person. He's got knowledge. But if within his mind he's still thinking of sense gratification, then he's got problems. Better the karma yogi who is working without attachment he is superior to the jnani, who is simply pretender. Not all jnanis are pretenders, but many are. And the karma yogi, he has to be sincere, he has to work without attachment. So that is the difficult thing. Commentary by Baladev Vijabhusan. Therefore, since you have impure heart, you must necessarily perform prescribed activities for purification of the heart. This means perform these prescribed activities without desire. Performing activities is better than renouncing all actions out of enthusiasm because this will gradually lead to attainment of jnana just as steps lead to the top of the stairs. This is because jnana will not arise in the contaminated heart of that person who prematurely renounces all actions out of enthusiasm only. So sometimes people are very enthusiastic to renounce. I can remember in, when I first joined the Krishna Consciousness Movement, so many young people, we were all young, and we all very, we had that idea, you know, we were about to renounce the world. Of course, we were not at all qualified to renounce anything, because we had not purified the heart. But we had that enthusiasm, you know, the enthusiasm was there. The enthusiasm was there in the young men when they were taking sannyas. They were enthusiastic to take sannyas, you know. So enthusiasm is not the only qualification. It's a good qualification, but it's not enough to maintain that mood of renunciation. There has to be the purification of the heart. So Prabhupada, uh, the comment Baladeva Vijayabhusan explains, performing activities is better than renouncing. Because by performing activities, we'll get purification and we will gradually develop knowledge. By doing karma yoga, we'll gradually develop knowledge. The example, just like steps lead to the top of the stairs. But the person who renounces prematurely, he's not going to develop knowledge because the heart is contaminated still. 
so he still has desires for material enjoyment. Baladeva Vijabhusan continues, Moreover, by renouncing all actions, you cannot even maintain your material body. Because he must maintain the body purified by sadhana as long as he lives. Even the jnani performs actions such as begging for food. But that begging is not to be done by you, a kshatriya. In other words, Lord Krishna is speaking to Arjuna and he's telling Arjuna, begging is not to be done by you, you're a kshatriya, you cannot beg. Therefore, you should earn wealth and taxes by your prescribed duties, prescribed actions such as fighting and protecting the citizens and accomplishing your bodily maintenance. With that, you should search out your atma. <laughs> All right, so this way Baladeva Vijabhusan is explaining how one should perform prescribed duty and do whatever is necessary to maintain the body and at the same time you have to search out the atma, understand the self within the body. Okay, going ahead, text number nine. An important verse, often, often quoted. Are we okay? Any questions so far? Uh, yes, Maharaj, I have a question. Yes. Uh, so when uh, you are saying like in the pure heart, Gyan arises, so what type of Gyan is it? Like is it Atma Gyan, Brahma Gyan, Paramatma Gyan, Bhagavad Gyan? Like what type of uh, Gyan is it uh, which arises? Well, that de will depend on the person. It will depend on that particular person and who is, who is hearing from. Who is guiding him? Okay. Yeah, you associate with the Mayavadis and you develop the impersonal Gyan and you associate with devotees, you develop the Bhakti and Muli Sukriti, Bhakti Gyan. Okay. Knowledge which brings one to devotee. Everything will depend on who you're associating, who you're associating with, who you're hearing from, who is guiding you. Thank you very much. Yes. So text number nine goes on, refuting the Sankhyaite philosophy. Sankhyaites, that there's no God, everything is just combination of elements. So this verse describes, work done as a sacrifice for Vishnu has to be performed. Otherwise work causes bondage in this material world. Therefore, O son of Kunti, perform your prescribed duties for his satisfaction. And in that way, you'll always remain free from bondage. So you do, if we do our work as a sacrifice, a yagya for the pleasure of Vishnu, yagya vai Vishnu, then that will give us freedom. But if we just simply work for our own enjoyment, for our own sake, this is bondage. So the Sankhyaite, he is defeated because they don't, they say don't do yagya, they say no need to sacrifice, they say there's no God, they say there's no one to worship, they just everything is just combinations of chemicals, ultimately everything is one. All right. So, referring to Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur's commentary on this verse, he explains that the Smriti, the Smriti meaning, not the Shruti, the Smriti means like Mahabharata and Puranas, they say that one is bound by actions. Therefore, I will become bound by per performing actions. Right? If the scriptures say that we get, that then you know, I'm going to be doing actions, I'm going to get entangled. This is like the, the doubt that Arjuna may have like this. That if I do actions, the scriptures say I'm going to get entangled, I'm going to be bound. But Lord Krishna replies, no, 
actions offered to the Supreme Lord does not bind one. That is explained in this verse. Yagnartat karmanan yatra loko yam karma bandana. Work is a sacrifice for Vishnu. There's no bondage. And so this is the point. You, you offer the work as a sacrifice. There's no karma. You don't get entangled. Dharma or scriptural duties offered to Vishnu without personal desire is called yagna. Persons become bound by karma, by any other actions for any other purpose. Right? If we do anything, any work, which is not for the pleasure of Vishnu, then we're, there will be karma. But if we offer our work for Lord Vishnu without personal desire, that is yajna. That frees us from bondage. But any other work, any other actions, any other purpose, there will be karma, will be entangled. Therefore, you should perform actions, karma, samachara, for accomplishing such duties, tad artam. Mm -hmm. All right, so this is the point. Perform yajna. We're going to hear about yajna. All right, so Arjuna replies, however, according to Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur, he's paraphrasing a conversation between Arjuna and Lord Krishna. But Arjuna says, but even if I perform actions which are offered to Vishnu, if I perform them with desires, then I will still become bound. So, Krishna replies, one should become devoid of the desire for results. Yeah, you have to give up the desire for results. Mukta Sangha. And then, we can quote this verse from Srimad Bhagavatam, Lord Krishna speaking to Uddhava from the 11th canto, 20th chapter. My dear Uddhava, a person who is situated in his prescribed duty, properly worshipping, properly worshipping by Vedic sacrifices, but not desiring the fruit of result of such worship, will not go to the heavenly planets. Similarly, by not performing forbidden activities, he will not go to hell. So what kind of yoga is being described here? It says, if you properly worship, if you do, you, you do your duty and you're doing Vedic sacrifices, uh, you you, and you don't desire the result, you won't go to the heavenly planets. Right? So what kind of yoga is that? Maharaj, is it Nishkam Karma Yoga? Yes, very good. Right. Nishkam Karma Yoga. Right. Krishna is describing Nishkam Karma Yoga. We don't, why wouldn't we want to go to the heavenly planets? Then Maharaji, you can say, because Maharaj, from heavenly planets also we come down, like whoever goes to heavenly planets, there is a lot of enjoyment, but it's not free from birth, death, old age and disease. Okay, yeah. And, and why will people go to the heavenly planets? As you say, they'll go for enjoyment, sense gratification. Simply sense gratification is there in the heavenly planets. You don't want to go there for that. You don't want sense gratification. We're trying to give up sense gratification, get away from sense gratification. It's a waste of time. We're never satisfied with sense gratification. We will hear at the end of the third chapter, lust burns like fire, is never satisfied. So, we won't go to the heavenly planets. Karma Yogi doesn't want to go to heavenly planets. And by not performing forbidden activities, he will not go to hell either. He didn't do any forbidden activities, so he doesn't have to worry about going to hell. 
And he doesn't have to worry about going to heaven either. Because you go to heaven, you just simply waste your time. You stay there, you go to heaven, you stay there a long time, you have a long life. And you have a lot of sense gratification, and very easy to forget Krishna. You go there in that atmosphere, very sensual, and very difficult to remember Krishna. So devotees want to avoid that, right? And so this is Lord Krishna speaking to Uddhavan. We're explaining this in relation to this section of the Bhagavad Gita. Okay, so next section, text 10 up to 16, describing Karma Kanda to Karma Yoga. Karma Kanda, described here, text number 10. In the beginning of creation, the Lord of all creatures sent forth generations of man and demigods along with sacrifices for Vishnu, and bless them by saying, Be thou happy by this yagna, because its performance will bestow upon you everything desirable for living happily and achieving liberation. So this is karma kanda, right? It's performance, you're going to do yagya, you're going to do a sacrifice, and the result of the yagya will be, will bestow upon you everything desirable for living happily and achieving liberation. Oh, sounds so nice, doesn't it? Oh yes, let's do this yagya, we'll be happy. So the Lord, listen, in the beginning of the creation, he, they, the, the men and demigods came and they came along with sacrifice for Vishnu, yagna by Vishnu, there has to be that yagya. So regulated sense gratification leads to purification. The Vedic culture provides a system by which the materially attached person can satisfy his material desires yet gradually become purified, right? Can you think of anything? Can you give me some examples how the Vedic culture provides a system so that the materially attached person can satisfy his material desires and yet gradually become purified? Give some examples. One is eating meat, Maharaj, like uh, if someone is very materialistic and wants to eat meat, so the Vedas tell uh, the procedure how they can eat meat, they have to wait for a certain duration and some uh, procedure, so because of which their uh, tendency to eat meat keeps on reducing. Yes, what do you have to do if you want to eat meat? I think uh, they have to wait for Amavasya and uh, then in the eye of the, uh, like, wh whoever they want to eat, they have to say, Maam Saha, ki, like, today I am killing you, tomorrow you can kill me, and slowly they get purified. Yes, they, they can take an animal like a goat, and they take it before the goddess Kali on the dark moon night. The dark moon night means once in a month, not every day, but once in a month. They can go before the goddess Kali with the goat and they tell the goat, as you said, I'm killing you, in the future you can kill me. And in this way the man can eat the meat of the goat. But the under understanding is, in the future the goat will come and the goat will have a human form and the man will be a goat and he will be killed. So that's one example. Any other examples? Of course, householder life is like that. Materially attached person, they get married into family life and they can satisfy their material desires and at the same time become purified. Householder life is a responsibility 
And with that responsibility, people become purified. So it's actually a part of the Vedic culture that you get trained first of all in brahmachari life and then you enter into household grihastha ashram and with controlled mind and senses one can become purified. So the whole Vedic culture is meant for purification. Yes, any, anybody else? Any other examples? Maharaj, worshipping uh, uh, Saraswati for getting knowledge, something like... Okay, yes. The worshipping of the different demigods, that they can satisfy our material desires, but at the same time we'll understand that the results of their worship is limited and temporary. And we will go on to want to understand how can we get eternal benefit? What do we need to do to get eternal benefit? So this is a purification. You follow the Vedic culture and you will get purified. Prabhupada continues, to become situated under the protection of such a system, one must agree to regulate his enjoyment by the descending authority of Vedic formulas. So, like that, regulate his enjoyment. As we heard, you want to eat meat, once in a month you can kill the goat, not every day. And similarly in family life, you get, we get married, we can enjoy relationships with each other, but according to rules and regulations. That's it's for, for our purification. The husband and wife have to help each other to control their mind and senses for their purification. One following that system does not act simply as he desires. His mood of subservience to God's order. So this is an, an, an important point. We don't just simply act as we want, we have to take the instructions from the authorities. And what is the authority described here? The authority in the form of the Vedas. Even though his purpose is to attain sense pleasure, is purifying, for he is following Krishna's system. So follow Lord Krishna's system, and we get purified. We want sense gratification, we will get sense gratification, but we will get it in such a manner we get purified. And just like we may like to make money, if somebody likes to do business and make a lot of money, they should give 50%. 50% should be given for the service of the Krishna consciousness movement or for the Brahminical culture. And by giving in charity a portion of the results of one's work, we get purified. And similarly, when one's wife has a child, there are purificatory activities to be done. We read in Srimad Bhagavatam at the time of the birth of Lord Krishna, how Nanda Maharaj performed the Jatakarma, the religious ceremonies for the purification after the birth of Lord Krishna. So everything has to be, we have to learn how to purify everything. It's important for us. And this is Lord Krishna's system. So by following this Vedic system of sacrifice, one also implicitly accepts the principle that he is not independent. Rather, his enjoyment depends upon the satisfaction of higher authorities. This is difficult for people sometimes because we're so, we don't like to accept that somebody is our authority. We don't like to be under someone. But we have to. 
This is a very important part of the purificatory process. We have to accept that we're not independent and that we cannot enjoy independently of the higher authorities. So gradually, by following the Vedic system, one may accept an eternal, transcendental objective to replace his temporary fruit of goals. With that acceptance, one, ad one abandons the designation of karma kandi and becomes a karma yogi. Right? So, we, we don't want to remain a karma kandi. Karma kandi is the fruit of worker, one who wants to enjoy the material world. But when we have an eternal, transcendental objective, something spiritual, to replace the temporary fruit of gold, the, the temporary fruit of gold, that's for the karma kandi. But the eternal, transcendental objective, that is the goal of the karma yogi. No? Karma yogi, they, we want to go to the, into the spiritual world. So, a couple of important words to be understood from that, this text, right? We're talking about text number, yeah, oh, sorry, here, text number, number 10. Sahayagna prajashrisva purovacha prajapatihi enena prasavish yadvam eshavos ishtakama duk. So Ishtakamagduk and Prasavishyadvam. So we'll see these meanings. Prasavishyadvam. May you prosper in terms of progeny and opulence. Well, every mother and father would like that. It's a very nice blessing, right? We want to have nice progeny and opulence. And then Ishtakamaduk. Baladeva Vijabhusan says, the desired object is actually liberation. Thus, the transliteration of the last pada of this verse reads, May this yagya fulfill your desire for liberation by supplying bodily maintenance and knowledge of the Atma. So that's the, the results of yajna. The desire for liberation will be fulfilled and we, at the same time we'll be able to maintain the body and also cultivate knowledge of the Atma. Ishtakamaduk. Srila Prabhupada explains from the purport text number 11 Their pleasures, their meaning demigods' pleasures and displeasures are dependent on the performance of yagnas by the human being. Some of the yagnas are meant to satisfy particular demigods, but even in so doing, Lord Vishnu is worshipped in all yagnas as the chief beneficiary. So sometimes people do yagya and they may think they're just worshipping Shiva Yagya or something, but in order to perform that Yagya properly, they have to recognize Lord Vishnu. He's worshipped as Prabhupada said, he, he's the chief beneficiary in all Yagyas. And the pleasure of the demigods is in the Yagya. We have to do the Yagyas properly. We have to do everything nice, we must be very clean, we must offer pure paraphernalia and we have to chant the mantras properly. Many different things. Srila Prabhupada explains with a statement from Srimad Bhagavatam, 19th chapter. A demigod takes pleasure in seeing someone go back to Godhead. He is always pleased with a devotee of the Lord. So much so that by his adidaivic powers 
he may help the devotees in all respects. And by their actions, the Lord is pleased with them. There is an, in, there is an invisible chain of complete cooperation between the Lord, the demigods, and the devotees on earth. When Maharaj Parikshit decided to sit and hear Srimad Bhagavatam, the demigods were pleased and showered flowers on him. So Srila Prabhupada is giving us a little guidance about yagya, <laughs> that he is explaining the relationship between the Lord and the demigods and the devotees. The devotees are on earth, we're doing the yagya, and we have to please the demigods and the Supreme Lord. Of course, when we worship the Supreme Lord, then all the demigods are pleased. Just like Maharaj Parikshit decided to sit and hear Srimad Bhagavatam, so his yagya was hearing Srimad Bhagavatam. By doing that, the demigods were very pleased. They showered flowers on him. So this is very nice yagya. Now in text number 12, Prabhupada talks about the Pancha Mahayagya, right? The five great sacrifices. So these are described here for us. The five yagyas are, first of all, there's the study of the Vedas, which satisfies the rishis. Then second one is offering oblations of water before one's forefathers. The third one is offering oblations with ghee. And the fourth one is offering tribute, Buddha yagna, offering tributes. Uh, because uh, we, the, the different gods, the different devas, they want to also offer their tribute. We want to offer tribute to the Supreme Lord, all the different living entities, they will also want to offer something to the Supreme Lord. So this is the Buddha Yajna. And then finally, receiving guests properly, Nire Yajna. So guests come, they have to be properly respected, we consider them like, when, when a guest comes without invitation, he's considered like a demigod. It's like demigods who are coming to test us. There are many leelas like that, where the demigods come to test a devotee. So when Prabhupada talks about the Pancha Mahayagna, is referring to these five different yagyas. The study of the Vedas, then the offering of water to the forefathers, offering of oblations with ghee, then offering tribute, and then receiving the guests properly. These are the five sacrifices. Text number 13 continues in relation to offering food to the Lord. Devotees of the Lord are released from all kinds of sin because they eat food which is offered first for sacrifice. Others who prepare food for, per for personal sense enjoyment verily eat only sin. So it's our duty to offer food. Whatever we eat, it should be offered to Krishna. First offered in sacrifice. How do we offer the food in sacrifice? Just simply by reciting prayers. We must wash the food and then place the food on a suitable plate and place it in front of our deities, our photographs as we may have, put, in other words, on our temple altar. And then we should chant prayers, whatever regular prayers we are reciting for offering food. Usually we say, first of all, the Guru Pranam Mantra three times, 
And then you may say Panchatattva mantra three times, then Hare Krishna mantra three times. Or you may say, first of all, the Guru Pranam mantra three times, and then you may say, uh, Namo Brahmana Devaya. Go, oh, oh, no, Namo Mahabhadanaya. We may say, offer a prayer to Lord Chaitanya that you're the most merciful of all the incarnations of Krishna. So we can recite that prayer three times to Lord Chaitanya and invoke the mercy of Lord Chaitanya. And then finally offer a prayer to Lord Krishna, Namo Brahmana Devaya, Go Brahmana Hitayacha, Jagadhitaya Krishnaya, Govindaya, Namo Namaha. So these, these prayers are very special, very dear to Lord Krishna. And we can recite them when we're offering food. The purpose in reciting the prayers is we want to attract Lord Krishna to come and eat. It's very important, therefore, that we have the right mood, that when we offer the food, we must be clean and pure. And then we have to chant the prayers with a genuine desire that Lord Krishna will come and eat. So everything depends on the mood of the person making the offering and also the cook is very important. If one is doing cooking, he must be very pure and clean. Otherwise, when the food is offered, the Lord knows it and he will complain. And he will say, this food is not good. This food should never have been offered. The Lord can speak and he will speak to his devotees and tell them if he doesn't like the food we're offering to him. So we have to be very careful. So this is, uh, we do this uh, sacrifice, make a yagya. However, others who prepare food for personal sense enjoyment, these are the, they may be jnanis, they may be big yogis, but they just eat only sin. They don't offer their food. These big jnanis, the big jnanis, the big yogis, you won't see them offering food. So they just eat some sin. All right, we'll go ahead. The pancha suna. Hare Krishna Maharaji. Yes. Maharaji, um, I was in Haridwar a few days back, and uh, I saw people were uh, people donating uh, food to poor, but it was like non-offered and onion garlic, included onion garlic. So will it be like uh, considered, will be considered in donation or will be uh, considered in pious work? Or I think, uh, uh, so when I was looking at them, I was just thinking that they are simply distributing sins among uh, poor people, more sins to other people and uh, also on themselves. So is this the correct uh, interpretation or, I, or or it will be considered like into donation part also? Uh, well, you're saying people are giving food Yes, Maharaj. But it's not offered. Yes, Maharaj. So they're giving karma. But they're giving food to hungry people. So they have, okay. the, they have the mood of trying to help unfortunate people. So there's some good karma and there's some bad karma there. Ultimately, it's, uh, is it vegetarian food? Yes, Maharaji, puri chola. Yeah, so they're giving vegetarian at least, that's good. But still, vegetarian food also has karma. If it's not offered to Krishna, there's still going to be karma there. But, the people are hungry 
and if somebody is taking, somebody is giving for the poor, they're distributing food. And so it's material welfare activity. Material welfare activity will keep one in the material world. You feed the hungry people, next life the hungry people will come and feed you, will come back to you. You know, that what you do for someone will come back to you in the future. No, you have to be very careful like that. Like sometimes we give blood. So you give blood, somebody gets your blood, in the future you will get their blood. <laughs> Not very pleasant. Anyway, that's, that's the law of karma. Some good karma. You give some food to people, in the future they will also give you food when you are hungry. <laughs> we hope you're not, but... Okay, thank you, thank you, Anas. We, we want to be careful about creating karma. We like to give people prasadam. We don't just give them uh, boga. We give them prasadam, food offered to Krishna. So that's better. That's, Prabhupada said in the past, you know, people were more, they had more wealth, they could give money to people. But today people are all poor. So he said, at least they can give prasadam. So by giving prasadam to the hungry people, then we can purify these people. But if we give them food which is not offered to Krishna, it's just karma, karmic, there's going to be karma there. Our food is karma free, without karma. But these other people, whatever they're doing, this Mother Teresa and so on, they're distributing food. The people eat only sin. They don't know. They don't think about offering their food to the Lord. So this is an important point. So we have to learn to do this yagya. One of the first things we learn when we become devotees, how to offer food. So first we offer the food and then we partake. We don't take food which is not offered. We don't take the food of demigods. It may be offered even in the mind. That's okay. You can do that. If somebody has a very strong mind and they're able to offer the food in their mind, it's good. Uh, Maharaj but uh, uh, food offered to demigod is also the offered one, is not the not of non-offered. That is also like demigods are also the branch of uh, Supreme Personality and why it is not considered as offered. Well, you offer food to the demigods, you see Bharat Maharaj, he would Maharaj, offer… Uh, what I am asking is like being in Prihastha, sometimes uh, uh, we, we receive uh, prasad which, is, uh, which, is, which was offered to uh, demigods. So the, the only thing that we, uh, that the clarity here needed is that whether we should accept or we should eat or we should simply deny taking that. But I think that because whenever I, that the situation arises, I only think that it will be offense to a Vaishnava because demigods are the like Vaishnavas. Wouldn't it be counted as a Vaishnava Prat? No, it's not Vaishnava Prat. Rather, it's the instruction of the spiritual master that we don't accept the prasadam of the demigods. No. Right? You have to consider the order of the spiritual master. So Srila Prabhupada, not only Srila Prabhupada, but the previous acharyas, they all say, we don't accept the prasad of the demigods. We can take the prasad of the demigods, if it was initially Krishna or Vishnu prasadam and then it was offered to the demigods, then we can take it. But we don't take what is offered directly to the demigods without offering, first offering to Vishnu. Thank you, Maharaj. It was very important. In our daily life, we, we experience like very different. Yes. 
problems may be there, you just have to explain to people that we are Vaishnav and as Vaishnavs we only take Vishnu Prasada. You have your Deva Prasada, but we are Vaishnavas and we take Vishnu Prasada. So you have to politely explain to people like that, that thank you very much, but we take Vishnu Prasada. Thank you, Lord. Now, somebody was saying to me last week or somewhere, anyway, somebody said they wanted to offer the demigod prasadam to Krishna. And they said, in my mind, I want to offer to Krishna the demigod prasadam. I said, that's ridiculous. We don't offer the demigod prasadam to Krishna. We offer Krishna prasadam to the demigods. And she said, well, in my mind. I said, well, in your mind you can offer to Krishna and then offer to the demigods. But we don't offer to the demigods. Why? Because people will think the demigods, they'll think Krishna demigods are all one. They're all the same. But we recognize Krishna, Vishnu as the supreme and the demigods are under him. So the proper sacrifice is for the pleasure of Vishnu. We eat food offered to Vishnu and we don't prepare. Otherwise, it's just simply food for personal sense enjoyment. And they eat only sin. And of course, you could say, well, demigods is not for just for personal sense enjoyment. But def generally, you see these, these people who are worshipping demigods, generally they're all mayavadi, they have the impersonal idea, they think ultimately it's all one, there's no difference. So these people are actually offenders to Lord Vishnu, and because Lord Vishnu is the Supreme. And if they're offering to other gods, then it's an offence, they're the offenders. So we shouldn't take their food. Of course, we have to be polite, explain to them. Okay, going ahead. Then something called panchasuni is mentioned there. Panchasuni, the different items, the pestle, grinder, oven, water pot and broom. These are the five working instruments when used in a place living entities are slaughtered. <laughs> Not very pleasant, right? Living entities are slaughtered. So, here's a little exercise for you. From the sections, verses and purports, how would you explain to a modern audience the existence and position of demigods, the meaning of yagya or sacrifice, and its relevance for human society? How many people do we have in the class today? 13, Maharaj. Okay, so we have to divide the class. Uh, how will we do it? Uh, groups of four? Okay. One group of five. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Are we there? Okay, is everybody clear about what you have to do? Ex existence, existence and position of demigods, meaning of yagya or sacrifice, relevance for human society to a modern audience. <laughs> okay. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, put the groups.
Pak Tuk Pranto Bija. So, demigod existence may uh, uh, there is uh, we have read in Esopanishad uh, uh, verse number 12 where it is stated that if we uh, worship uh, demigods then uh, it will we will go to heaven. But uh, on the uh, if we re read uh, um, Bhagavad Gita 9.26 I think and uh, Srimad Bhagavatam then there is a uh, there is explanation that uh, one who, 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 who Recording in progress. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Mm. Maharaj, how we explain the modern society's existence for such and because we consider the modern society as the non Vaishnavas. Right. That's the point. Modern society, they're all materialistic minded people, not very cultured, they don't know anything. Okay. Can we use existing example, Maharaj? Yes. Not using how a government is uh, like governed by some personals, like we have prime minister, king, we have uh, those ministers who are working under them. Can we like explain in that way how, I mean, for those non devotees we can explain to them in that way yeah yeah that's good yeah nice can that be like an example of how you can explain uh -huh. so one simple example that so far and other senior disciples used to give that there is no point in watering the branches of a plant it's better to root, uh, give water to the root of a plant so vishnu over here is compared as the root of all the demigods and everyone and the all the demigods is compared as the branches of a plant mm -hmm. yeah yeah good oh. and what about yakya and sacrifice isn't this just a waste of money it was poor, poor. Why don't you feed the people, feed the hungry people instead of putting the ghee in the fire? You know, people will say you're just throwing the money away. Why not feed the hungry people? You put it in the fire. What a waste. The only yajna which is prescribed in this age is Sankirtan yajna. So, if one is performing Sankirtan yajna, then it is good. If he is not performing Sankirtan yajna, then it's simply accumulating karma on him. Okay. <coughs> Just... Because all the other ayajya, there are several rules and regulations, prohibitions and methods. And because in age of Kali Yuga, people and even the jnani are not, you know, not of that caliber. So we will end up into something else only. So Sankirtan Yajya is what has been prescribed for Kali Yuga. So if someone is doing Sankirtan Yajya, then it is good. Okay, yeah, good. Uh, but Maharaj, can we ex uh, take the sacrifices like, because like, we are indebted to demigods, to animals, sages, ancestors. That is why we are doing this kind of sacrifice and rituals. Can we accept in that way? We're doing the sacrifice for the pleasure of the demigods? Yeah, in no that, uh, like, if we are indebted to uh, for those demigods and all that, right? This is why uh, we are doing some sacrifice, like for rain, they will uh, go for Indra and all that. They will do the sacrifice for that kind of purposes. Uh huh. Mm, yeah, but some people may be. We are indebted. Sorry, Maharaj. 
We don't want to we don't want to encourage people in karma kandi activities, you know. Okay, we want to touch. If 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 we consider that we are indebted, then Maharaj, we are not only indebted to demigods, we are indebted to our parents, we are indebted to our ancestors, we are indebted to you know everyday everyday grain, you know, everyday grain that we are taking. We are indebted to cow for giving us milk. We are indebted to, you know, every single person. So, and we cannot please everyone. So, instead of pleasing everyone differently, let's try to please Krishna. So, if Krishna is pleased, then everyone else is pleased. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, can the conclusion be like we are doing this sacrifice uh, for, by chanting the holy name? We will just fulfill all the sacrifice that we don't have to do for demigods sages, animals, ancestors, and all that. We just simply do our Harnam Sankirtan and just pay. We don't have to pay them personally all the sacrifices. Does it count, Maharaj? Yeah, that's good. You're right. Yeah. We don't have to try to please everyone. We have to please Krishna. You please Krishna, then everyone's pleased. Recording in progress. <laughs> okay, you've got some good points. I think it's very good. I think we'll close the groups now. Recording in progress. Okay, Yagna Prabhu. Yagna. We can close the groups, Prabhu. Okay, ma'am. Okay, everyone's back. All right. I, I didn't get to hear all the groups, but uh, which group did I not come to? First group, Maharaj. The first group? Group one. Okay, group one. What have you got? What can you tell me about the existence and position of demigods? I'm a very modern man. I don't believe in demigods. I don't believe in all these things. What are you going to tell me? Not hearing anything. Yeah, who's the spokesman? Group number one? Hare Krishna. Yes, Prabhu. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. I'm having some. Krishna. You got some mic problem, huh? Yes? Maybe somebody else has to speak. If you have a mic problem, someone else can do it. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes, Hare Krishna Maharaji. Okay, Maharaj, demigods, we can explain to the modern human society as how kings are that one, one king will be there and he has different ministers to where they will be in charge of certain things. So demigods are like the ministers who are in charge of certain things. So the king is the Lord. So we can explain like that to the humans now for the current modern human. Where do, these, where do these people live? 
they do have their own uh, world like some baby girls live in a, uh, like 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 uh, Lord Shiva he has his own world but Kartikaya he has his own world and some baby girls they live in a, like Indra he is the in charge of the heaven why don't we see them? Because, uh, based, uh, I'm not so sure about that. <laughs> yeah, anybody would like to say why we can't see the demigods? Uh, so, uh, I would like to answer my answer. So, yeah. like, for example, to see anything, even like inside our body, a lot of things are there, liver, kidney, a lot of things are there, but we cannot see directly. We need to do some uh, uh, experimentation. We need some efforts to see that. Say, we demigo the excess. If we want to see them, we need certain qualification, then only we can see them. Okay. Yeah. We have to have some. We have to have some power, some special qualification, some introduction. No? Yes. Yes, Maharaj ji, uh, someone yes, asked sir. Prabhupada Maharaj ji, uh, can you show us uh, Krishna? Then Prabhupada Maharaj said, uh, uh, Krishna is always with us. You don't have, you, one should have that uh, uh, eyes to see Krishna. So, uh, uh, it, since we are, if we have imperfect senses, so we are not able to see. Okay. Yes. Prabhupada also said, uh, why you give so much importance to seeing? Why can't you hear? Why can't you just simply hear? That we hear there's so many demigods. We hear about them. And so many times they've been described. We see so many, there's temples of demigods. Do you think this is all just make-believe? You don't, you don't believe there are essentially people like that? There are. But you have to be you have to be a little open-minded. You have to understand there's so much control in the world. And these demigods, they are the controllers. They're controlling all the features of the material nature. All right. So, Tosi Krishna Priya Maharaji, what about the meaning of yagya and sacrifice? Uh, according to the group discussion, he said, sacrifice means we, you should sacrifice certain things so that you will be able to gain something bigger. That's the meaning of yashna. So here, so example that just now we saw that we need to perform, means we need to offer the food as a sacrifice to the Lord so that we'll be able to um, to have the sanctified food without a sin. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. to have, we ha need to offer the food to the Lord so we can have sanctified food for our own self. We'll purify yes, us. Much. Right? Yes. Yes, much. Oh, we'll purify. No, okay. Yeah, that's nice. Yes, anybody else? The relevance of this sacrifice for human society? Uh, Maharaj, according to Prabhupada's purport of uh, chapter 3, uh, 3, 1, uh, 3, 14, Prabhupada, uh, here it says that sacrifice is needed so that the rain may be there. When there's the rain, the food grains will grow so that it will be, so that the body will be maintained. So that's the that's the aim of sacrifice according to uh, purport of three point fourteen. So the the, pur the meaning is the purport the meaning of sacrifice is for the gain of the body. For the development. Oh, me, 
No, I mean the re- uh, the relevance for human society. Yes. What is it then? Sacrifice. How is it relevant for human society? It will help the body to develop. I'm sorry. Can you could you just repeat again? Uh, when we do sacrifices, yajnas, so uh, we will have rains. Yes. When we have rains, so the food grains will grow. Yes. When the food grains grow, the bodies will be maintained. Uh-huh. Uh, that's the relevance. Okay, so for the maintenance of the body, we have to have food grains. And to get food grains, we have to do... Y- we have to have rain, and to have yes. to get rain, there has to be yagya. Uh, well, uh, you know, I never did any yagya, but it's raining. Because our main uh, Kali Yuga, Rol Chaitanya said, the yagya for Kali Yuga is Harinam Sankirtan. So when we chant, automatically there's rain. When there's rain, there's food grains oh. in the body. Is no, okay. <laughs> so when we chant, yeah. Very good. All right. Thank you very much. We'll go ahead. Let's read a little bit here. The power of Bhagavat Prasad. This is from text number 14. When there is an epidemic disease, oh, this is very relevant for us here today. (laughs) When there is an epidemic disease, an antiseptic vaccine protects a person from the attack of such an epidemic. Similarly, food offered to Lord Vishnu and then taken by us makes us sufficiently resistant to material affection. And one who is accustomed to this practice is called a devotee of the Lord. Therefore, a person in Krishna consciousness who eats only food offered to Krishna can counteract all reactions of past material infections, which are impediments to the progress of self-realization. So beautiful statement by Srila Prabhupada. We just have to eat food offered to Krishna, then we can overcome all the reactions of the past effect, infections. All the material infections can be removed by prasada. <laughs> so this is the real vaccine for the epidemic. Take Krishna prasada. So text 14, here's the, the verse which we've been speaking about. All living bodies subsist on food grains which are produced by rain. Rains are produced by performance of yagya and yagya is born of prescribed duties. So importance of yagya described here. So karma kanda leads to karma yoga. Lord Vishnu is worshipped in all yagyas as the chief beneficiary. Right? When we're chanting Hare Krishna, we're also worshipping Lord Vishnu. Lord Vishnu is not different from Lord Krishna. The all-pervading transcendence is eternally situated in acts of sacrifice. Text number 15. The all-pervading transcendence, meaning the Supreme Lord, Vishnu. He is situated in acts. So that yagya, that fire sacrifice that you see in the illustration, that is actually the mouth of Lord Vishnu. And when we offer the food grains, when we offer the ghee and the food grains, into the fire, we're actually offering them into the mouth of Lord Vishnu. And when Lord Vishnu is satisfied, then everyone, all living entities are satisfied. Right? Do you believe? Maraj, I have a question here. Yes. So, uh, here we are saying that the various demigods are are in charge of the material universe and when the Lord created both men and the demigods, he said perform yagya. 
So the yagyas performed are for satisfaction of the demigods, but ultimately Lord is pleased. So, so how how do we understand that? I mean, because if if the Lord is to be ultimately pleased, then why don't we offer directly to the God? Why we are why there is advice of the via medium? Well, where does it say that we have to offer to the demigods? Because it, it said in the one of the uh, purports that we read that uh, if we just take uh, and we don't give, then we are thief only. I will exactly come. So in the twelfth one, it is said, in charge of various necessities of life, demigods being satisfied by performance of yagya will supply necessities to you. Yes. So how are the demigods satisfied? They're satisfied because we satisfy Lord Vishnu. When we satisfy Lord Vishnu, then all the demigods are satisfied because they're the branches, right? Lord Vishnu is the root. And the branches get their nourishment from Lord Vishnu. So it's not that we have to satisfy the demigods independently of Lord Vishnu. Right? They're not independent of Lord Vishnu. But you can, we know also Bharat Maharaj offered to the demigods and he worshipped each demigod as a part of the form of Lord Vishnu. Just like we know uh, the, the, the different, uh, for example, the sun planet, the sun is like the eye of the Lord and the, the lower planets are like the feet of the Lord and the higher planets are the head of the Lord. The different parts of the universe are all related to different parts of the Supreme Lord. So the different demigods, they are also situated within the form of the Lord. And they represent a part of the body of the Lord. So when Bharat Maharaj was worshipping the different demigods, he considered the demigods in that way. He, he didn't consider them as the Supreme, but he considered them as a part of the Supreme Lord. So it depends on, the, on how one is actually worshipping these demigods. You see, other if somebody is worshipping the demigods and thinking, he is supreme, this one, or they're all one, they're all the same, then that's not good. But we can worship, simply we worship Lord Vishnu or Lord Krishna and we satisfy all the demigods. Right? Thank you, Maharaj. Yes. Yeah. All right, from Srila Prabhupada's purport of 316. The Mammonist philosophy of work very hard and enjoy sense gratification is condemned herein by the Lord. Right, Maman is their idea. Just simply work like the mudha and then get sense gratification. They just work for material sense gratification. So this is not acceptable by, to Lord Krishna. Therefore, for those who want to enjoy this material world, the above-mentioned cycle of performing yagyas is absolutely necessary. There is no necessity of rigidly following the performances of the prescribed yagyas for the transcendentalists who are above vice and virtue but those who are engaged in sense gratification require purification by the above-mentioned cycle of yagnic performances. All right? So, people want to enjoy the material world, then they can enjoy by doing yagya. This is the proper way to enjoy the material world. You do it through sacrifices, by satisfying the Supreme Lord, then you can enjoy. The, uh, but there's no need to uh, do the different yagyas for the pleasure of the demigods. There's no necessity rigidly for 
following the performances of the prescribed yagyas for the transcendentalists. You see, we are transcendentalists. We are the bhaktas, we are the transcendentalists. So we are above these things. But for people who are engaged in sense gratification, they require purification. They have to do the yagya performance. Now, of course, we use, as you were saying, yagya, thank your time. No, but we also do that. Of course, although we're transcendentalists, it doesn't mean we don't do anything. We have to perform, we engage in sankirtan for the pleasure of the Lord. But for people whose motive is simply sense gratification, then it's very important they have to do yagya. And who can do yagya? You need the transcendentalist to do the yagya. But we don't have to. We don't have to rigidly do all these yagyas because we're doing everything for the pleasure of Vishnu. Other materialists, they're engaged in these, these sinful activities, some good, some pious, some sinful, but devotees transcendental to pious and sin. The devotees on the transcendental platform, it's all for the pleasure of Krishna. So we don't need to do all these yagyas. We simply work for Krishna, everything for Krishna. So this is niskam karma, to set the example. Even kings such as Janaka attain perfection solely by performance of prescribed duties. Therefore, just for the sake of educating the people in general, you should perform your work. Lord Krishna is giving the instruction, they need to set an example, to show the people the right example. Although you don't, don't have to do it, you should do it anyway, to teach the people. This is text number 20. And text 21, whatever actions a great man performs, common men follow. Whatever standards he sets by exemplary acts, all the world pursues. So this is the principle behind advertising. You know, we see some famous movie star and they use this soap. So you should also use this soap, you know, <laughs> like that. The common, common man will follow some great person. Whatever standards he set, all the world pursues. Prabhupada explains, Lord Chaitanya said that a teacher should behave properly before he begins teaching. One who teaches in that way is called Acharya or the ideal teacher. So before begin teaching we have to behave properly, right? We have to, we have to be an example. The king or the executive head of a state the father, the school teacher are all considered to be natural leaders of the innocent people in general. All such natural leaders have a great responsibility to their dependents. So we have to see the leaders, the, the importance of having qualified leaders is a very big problem in the world today. Politicians are often corrupt, heads of state, they run away, they take all the money with them, and even the school teachers and the heads of the family are not very good examples. So, text 22, Lord Krishna explains, O Sanaprita, there is no work prescribed for me within all the three planetary systems, nor am I in want of anything, nor have I a need to obtain anything, and yet I am engaged in prescribed duties. So Lord Krishna gives himself as an example. He already gave the example of Janak Maharaj, who is a liberated soul, but he's performing work to show the example. Now Lord Krishna is giving a second example that he himself, that he doesn't need anything, but he's doing duties. From the purport, Although such rules and regulations are for the conditioned souls and not Lord Krishna, because he descended 
to establish the principles of religion, he followed the prescribed rules. Otherwise, common man would follow in his footsteps because he is the greatest authority. So very important to show the right example. Lord Krishna continues, if I did not perform prescribed duties, all these worlds would be put to ruination. I would be the cause of creating unwanted population. Text number 24. So Lord Krishna is explaining the need to show the right example. Um, uh, actually, this, this point defeats the argument. Uh, the, the, well, the important point is the acharya principle, right? The, one has to be an acharya. You have to show the right example. Otherwise, the whole world will go to hell because people will follow the example of the authorities. I would be, Krishna says, I would be the cause of creating unwanted population. If I did not perform prescribed duties, I will be the cause. Now earlier, Arjuna was worried that if he fought, it would be the cause of creating unwanted population. Remember, in the first chapter, Arjuna was describing that if I fight, the elders will be killed, then the people will become irreligious, and then the women will become unprotected, and the, when the women are not protected, there will be unwanted progeny. So Arjuna was arguing that he would, be, that if he fought, it would be the cause of creating unwanted population. But here, Krishna is saying, if we don't do our duties, then it will be the cause of creating unwanted population. Just the opposite from what Arjuna was arguing. So it defeats that argument of Arjuna. So what is the difference between following and imitating, right? Some people want to imitate, they want to, you know, I want to imitate Krishna, I'm going to put a peacock feather in my head, I'm going to carry a flute, I'm going to be Krishna. That, we could say that's imitating. What about, what's following Krishna? Maharaj? Yes? Imitating comes from the, the contaminated desire of enjoying. So when we see, it comes from enjoying what that person is enjoying by becoming like him or by doing what he is doing. Following is following what he has asked us to do. Like in following Krishna means following the words of Krishna or following the devotees of Krishna. Imitating Krishna is trying to enjoy like Krishna. Okay. Can you give some Maharaj, Yes? Maharaj, Isopanishad, verse 6. Yastu Sarvani Bhutanya Manu Pashyati. So here it is also stated like Anusaran and Anukaran. So if we do Anukaran, that is imitating. And Anusaran stands for Anupashyati, which stands for we should we, we see through Acharyas. We, we, uh, uh, we follow Acharyas, we follow Vedas, we follow uh, our scriptures. Yeah. We don't do imitation. Yes. So what's the difference between we follow acharyas. What's the difference between following and imitating? I, I, you didn't explain. You just told me the words. But what is? How, how can I distinguish between? Um, how do I know if I'm actually following or just imitating the acharyas? Like uh, 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 Shiva drank uh, poison, but we cannot imitate uh, drinking poison. We will die. Okay. So that is imitation. Yes. But uh, Anusaran or uh, the uh, Anupashati uh, is uh, when we follow Acharyas, that is on the footprints of Acharyas, on the uh, uh, on the teachings of Acharyas. Uh -huh. Okay. So that is Vani Seva. Yeah, Lord Shiva, people say Lord Shiva smoked ganja, so I will smoke ganja. But Lord Shiva also drank ocean of poison. So can you drink ocean of poison? Of course not. And then people want to imitate Krishna. But Lord Krishna 
they want to imitate Krishna dancing with the gopis. But Lord Krishna also picked up Govardhan Hill. Can you pick up the Govardhan Hill? So that's imitating. We want to follow Krishna. Follow Krishna doesn't mean follow Krishna means to follow Krishna's doesn't mean you just walk in the footsteps behind him literally, but it means follow his example or follow his teachings. That's important. What is his actual teaching, his instructions to surrender to Krishna, right? So don't just imitate, don't just dress up like Krishna, but actually follow. Krishna came to establish Dharma. So help in the mission of Lord Krishna to teach real religion. Hi Krishna Maharaj. Yes. Uh, Maharaj, I, I want to mention, I heard in a lecture that uh, um, uh, just like Srila Haridas Thakur chants three Latin names of Lord in a day, so uh, some people try to imitate, although uh, Srila Prabhupada recommended us to chant your 16 rounds nicely and after that you can preach, you have to preach. Um, so uh, some like to, some people like to uh, imitate Srila Haridas Thakur, but we cannot be like him, we, we can follow him, the way he chants uh, the rounds nicely, but we have to follow the Acharya, what Srila Prabhupada said. That on Ekadashi we can chant uh, more rounds, but preaching is very important. We should chant over 16 rounds nicely and then we have to preach. That's what I wanted to mention. Okay, thank you. Very nice. Anyone else? Okay, so just to finish off here, what we covered. Understanding eradicated Arjuna's doubt in regard to non-difference between the path of Sankhya and Karma Yoga. Arjuna's doubt, which one did Krishna want? So they're the same, but of the two, Karma Yoga is easier. Then the true meaning of Karma Sanyas. The true meaning of Karma Sanyas is that we shouldn't be attached to the karma. We cannot give up work but we should not be attached to the karma. Then Krishna's response to Arjuna's fourth reason for not fighting, Krishna's response is, fourth reason about, the fourth reason was about unwanted progeny, <laughs> right? So Krishna said, if you, if, you, if, you, if you don't do your duty, then be the cause. We have to show the right example the need for example is there. The difference between following and imitating we just discussed and how important is it for devotees to eat only Krishna Prasadam? Very, very important. You don't want to eat anything else except Krishna Prasadam. That's the best way to purify the mind and keep a healthy body. Discuss ways they could modify their actions to benefit those who follow their example with reference to the Acharya principle. Modify actions to benefit those to follow their example. Well, the point is that we have to understand to teach by our example, not to just simply give instructions, but to actually show the right example to be peaceful, to be clean, to be well-mannered, to be good character is very important to have good qualities and, that will, and, and impress people. Our own example is the best way of preaching to people. The meaning of yagya, sacrifice, relevance for human society we discussed. And why Krishna follows Varnashram Dharma? to set the example for everyone because he doesn't want everyone to fall into maya. And discuss ways in which we can preach to others by which their quality of work changes from mundane to transcendental, bringing people to transcendental consciousness. We, we want people to understand that there's a higher nature there are people, personalities who we don't see, but they're controlling 
and they're directing the affairs of this material world, the different demigods, and we can please them by performing sacrifice. So gradually people can become more transcendentally situated. The final quote, one who desires to improve himself must follow the standard rules as they are practiced by the great teachers. So tomorrow we're going to go on with chapter 3, so you can look over it from 25 up to 43. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Maharaj, I have a question. If, uh, yes, yes Prabhu, please go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, Maharaj, like you were saying, ki because we are devotees, so we don't have to uh, follow the general yagyas that are uh, prescribed. Uh, in one of the lecture I was uh, hearing, so the devotee was saying, ki, uh, like for us, like I am working in a company also. So what we, we are, we are more of like uh, bhakti meshri karma yogis. We, we are not proper bhakti yogis because we do a lot of karma also. And we do like sadhana, hearing lecture, chanting for some time. So that's why we have to perform all the karma kind of activities also because we are uh, not uh, like full time engaged in bhakti yoga. Uh, only for those who are full-time into Bhakti Yoga, they can... So, uh, I am not clear, Maharaj, on this. Uh, if you can, please. Well, we don't perform Karma Kandi activities, but we will perform Karma Yoga activities. Karma Kandi activities are... The motivation is simply for our own sense gratification. So, we don't want to come to that level. But mm. we, we do want to do... You may have to do... We can do Yagyas. You can do the yagya. Okay, that's not wrong. That's good. Yes, because remember, we just heard the importance of the example. Even though you're transcendentally liberated soul, still you will so show the right example. And even kings like Janaka and Lord Krishna himself, they're very conscious to show the right example. And so we shouldn't think, you know, I'm a devotee, I don't need to do this. No, we should do these things. But we don't do things which are just simply based around sense gratification. It should always be in relation to Krishna. So ka karma yoga, not karma kanda. Karma kanda is simply thinking for my body. So we must see everything in relation to Krishna, Krishna consciousness. Okay. Yes, Madam. Thank you, Madam. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? All right. So we'll meet tomorrow. Our, our, tomorrow's Balaram Jayanti. Are you okay? We can still have a program? We can still have class? No, Maharaj. Huh? No, uh, tomorrow is holiday, Maharaj. Oh, tomorrow's holiday. Oh, okay. Yes. Okay, so we have a holiday tomorrow. <laughs> Give you time to work on your essays if you're not taking part in the Balaram program. But try to attend, at least virtually. Everything will be online, many places, I'm sure you can attend. Get the mercy of Lord Balaram, very important. We get spiritual strength from Lord Balaram. Lord Balaram is the source of all spiritual strength, so you need to worship him. And the way to worship him, observe his. Appearance day tomorrow. Okay, so we'll see you next week. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank you, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna.